So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And thank you to Trust for hosting me and uh, providing me with a community for so many years. Uh, this is a special event for me because it's probably my last in Berlin for a long time. And because I arrived in Berlin a decade ago this month, just before the Snowden leaks and the ensuing summer of Snowden, a relevant topic for tonight's audio play. Um, so today, as Lena said, I'm going to talk for about 15 to 20 minutes about my work and give some more foundational context for the play. And then we'll present the play, which runs 26 minutes. Um, the play is whispered and can be difficult to understand, so I'll also be projecting the script and provide a website where you could also read along on your phone at the end of this talk. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to try to skip through a lot of topics extremely quickly, so please excuse my brevity, and I'm happy to discuss more later. Um, that part I'm skipping. <laughs> so for nearly 10 years, which is nearly impossible for me to believe, I've worked with and around ASMR autonomous sensory meridian response. ASMR describes a tingling sensation in the scalp and spine that's triggered by soft sounds, whispering, nail tapping, hair brushing. It's a phenomenon not born of, but cohered by the internet and specifically YouTube, where over 20 million ASMR or ASMR labeled videos have been posted since 2008. This is one of my favorite ASMR videos. Um, it's an example of unintentional ASMR. It's called Kevin Eight Full Moon ASMR. And in this video, Yang Hai Ying, the YouTuber, feeds and speaks softly to her cat, Kevin, before going outside at the end of the video to stare at and um, kind of exclaim in awe over the full moon. Uh, the, atmos the atmospheric sounds of the video are soft enough to trigger ASMR. And I've always been most interested in the tingling sensation of ASMR as a byproduct of environmental sounds when the setting or the set of everyday life hijacks your nervous system. But this talk isn't about ASMR, it's about Lol's Noon, my play, which you'll hear today and which is whispered. So it derives from my experiments with ASMR but is no longer directly related to the phenomenon itself. As I've worked through the various angles of ASMR over the past decade, one thing that I've gotten stuck on, perhaps because of my training in literature and as a writer, is how narrative and plot might be conveyed only in whispers, and the effect that might have both on the telling of a story and on the audience's experience of it. Here's a clip from the American reality television show Big Brother. It was posted to YouTube in 2007, 15 years ago, one year before ASMR was given its name in a Yahoo chat forum. Here, captured by an always-on surveillance camera, two characters conspire. What they're saying to each other is vital for the scenes that follow, but impossible for the audience to understand. The video was picked up by ASMR viewers as the fanship developed and is held up as a marvelous example of the phenomenon in the wild. What's fascinating to me is that the plot triggered by this gossip is completely removed from the experience of ASMR. ASMR videos, after all, are designed to make the viewer tune out, to lock into the sounds to the point where content doesn't matter. Similar to the way that you speak to a dog, I can say anything as long as I say it in the right tone. I once dedicated an hour of my now defunct ASMR radio show, You're Worth It, to that clip from Big Brother, just looping it and mixing it around. Um, long live Berlin Community Radio. Um, for me, all of this intersects in a fascinating way with, with what I've always loved about whispering, which is its essential ambiguity. Whispers are loaded utterances. They carry conspiracy, secrecy, intimacy, seduction, intrigue, threats, adoration, care. Lacking the resonance and tone of voiced speech, they're less expressive. And so when I speak in a whisper, if you don't hear the content, it's impossible to distinguish between a threat and a declaration of love, which is sometimes also a threat. Um, I began to, oh, we're still here, okay. I began to think as a writer and not as an ASMR, uh, ASMR artist about how this ambiguity works spatially, for example, in the theater, 
via the classic technique of the stage whisper, and correspondingly about the different kinds of plots that are triggered by whispered speech, what I'm calling whisper choreographies. This is Beckett's extremely short play, what he called a dramaticule, which is a really great term, um, called Come and Go. Here, three characters are perched on a bench in an ambiguous ambiguous setting, discussing their circumstances seemingly detached from the past and from the future. They're forgetful. One at a time, they leave the bench to do something also unspecified off stage. While that third person is off stage, one character scoots towards the others on the, on the other on the bench to share ugh, to share a whispered secret that provides some essential clarity about their circumstances. We'll see this happen um, in a short, in a second. It's a very short or a slow moving play, so it takes a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good. The director yeah. stretched this play that should take three minutes out into like 10 minutes, so it goes very slow. I wanted to get to the secret before I move on. Yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I keep on leaning into the mic. Okay, so the two characters swear not to tell the third the secret that was just passed before the third returns to the bench, and so on, each of them cycles off stage, and the other two share a secret. At the end of the play, all three characters sit on the bench, facing forward and gripping hands in a manner that Beckett explicitly choreographed, as shown here, um, which also represents the chain of the whispered secrets through the play. The come and go whispers, the content of which is not scripted, in which the actors, as you saw, merely go, shh, shh, shh. the audience does not hear. And that is not typical of the stage whisper, which rather should carry a plot or character development forward by cluing in the audience at the expense of the other characters on the stage. Stage whispers either break the fourth wall for a character to communicate their internal thoughts to an audience, or in rarer cases, for characters to communicate secrets to one another to which the audience but no other characters are privy. I think about Shakespeare plays as the pinnacle of the stage whisper, full of intrigue, layered plots, and misdelivered secret messages. But actually, as you see here from a quick search on Shakespeare online, um, they are used sparingly. There aren't very many occurrences of purposely cued whispers in Shakespeare. Um, and naturally, I've also been searching for plays that are dominated by whispering, hence my stack overflow question in the lower right, um, and to no results. And I know why. Stage whispers don't dominate plots because they're difficult for an audience to understand in large quantities, and they're difficult for actors to voice. I know that personally because I whispered for 100 hours one month to train an AI whisper and permanently damaged my vocal cords. Um, <laughs> Perhaps plays cannot be comprised solely of secrets after all. But in approaching Lull's Noon, I asked myself, what if I didn't care? What if I started writing narrative works for whispering where not understanding the plot was part of the audience experience? Would it be interesting to create works that had intricately plotted narratives, but that challenged full audience comprehension? And what would the plot of those plays need to be? Well, it just so happens that I also have a deep interest in the culture, history, and technical documentation of cryptography and cryptographic systems. I began to think that a plot growing out of cryptography's culture and primitives that worked with whispers, thereby challenging audience comprehension and playing with the security and insecurity of communication could be quite interesting. And luckily for me, there's a pre-existing cast of characters when one approaches cryptography. Alice and Bob were introduced as the hapless and bumbling communicating parties in this iconic 1978 cryptography paper, which deployed them as example users in a public key crypto system. You see down in the lower right-hand corner, that's the first occurrence of Alice and Bob ever. 
Um, and over the ensuing decades, Alice and Bob have been called upon again and again in scientific literature, not only cryptography related to illustrate example agents. They also gained friends, each of whom tends to play an archetypal role, especially in cryptography contexts. So among others, we have Charlie or Carol, the courier, Eve, the eavesdropper, Grace, the government agent, Mal, Mallory, Mike, a malicious actor, Faith, a trusted advisor, and Sybil, the pseudonymous hacker who threatens Alice and Bob. I considered that Alice and Bob and their friends as archetypes playing out mathematical and physical proofs were something like typed characters, which I mean in reference to static typing of programming languages. That is, they have to define return values and variables according to a set of predefined categories. I found that this consideration initiated a creatively dense intersection of the archetypes of literary theory and the primitives of programming. The first and perhaps most obvious plot that I happened upon, which is the plot of Lull's Noon, and to a certain extent my other Alice and Bob work to date, Sybil's Primes, considers what happens when typed characters defy their types, argue with the permissions of their environments, and attempt to gain right access on their environments and their rule sets. To say a bit more about those environments, um, reading through the literature, I became fascinated by the spaces and staging of Alice and Bob cryptography papers, which seemed to me to be innately theatrical. After all, there are trap doors on stages and in cryptographic functions. But even beyond that, I began to consider the set of all Alice and Bob papers as the conjoined staging of a meta-communication problem that Alice and Bob are having, one that could be closely linked to the staging of my whisper choreographies. Indeed, Alice and Bob's recurrence throughout the literature makes them funny characters to observe on a meta or series level. They appear to be a couple, but they seem to have no relationship history. In each paper, they are instantiated anew, without any of their previous baggage, because they have no memory of each other. And in most cryptography papers, they are attempting to communicate securely, to communicate at all, to play a game, but the stakes of the communication and the games and the content itself is completely unimportant. They seem to have a somewhat dysfunctional relationship given their struggle to attain a degree of trust in their communications, but we never really know why that is. In this way, Alice and Bob seem to me to be like Beckett characters who often, as I noted about come and go, occupy abstract or minimally defined, minimally described landscapes and have confusing, ill-defined, amnesiac relationships to one another. This abstraction and disorientation of space, of language, of relation is to me increasingly relevant given what I think our ongoing reality fractures were, were um, experiencing. So as such, Lull's Noon is my attempt to write Alice and Bob as Beckett as Looney Tunes, because in Looney Tunes, the characters also don't carry memories from one episode to another. They never learn. They simply spiral through their rule sets and the attendant interactions over and over and over again. Here, perhaps apocryphally, are Chuck Jones's rules for the coyote, which illustrate this point nicely. Um, in the iconic cartoon, Duck Amok, Daffy, Daffy Duck attempts to do his job by plastically, as a cartoon, reacting to his landscape. But he is at the whim of a sadistic cartoonist who keeps changing things up on him, much as Alice and Bob are shuttled between papers, spiraling between scenes, never quite reaching a stasis at which they could assess their relationships or even themselves. At the, uh, the, the, final, the end of Duck Amok, Daffy demands who is responsible for this, who is responsible for this? and know. we Boy. zoom out to Bugs Bunny, the cartoonist. Who is responsible for Bugs, for any of this? That is also the defining question of Lull's Noon. Um, so because in defiance of everything I just said about stage whispers being difficult to understand, Lull's Noon is whispered, and so I want to give you some context on the play. Um, in our world, we're around a rather abstract desert mesa. You see a map here. And all around the mesa are lulls. What are lulls? 
we never quite know. They're rooted or mined by hackers who inhabit the Mesa landscape, and there are two rough categories of lulls. New lulls are legal for hackers to root. They seem to give a hacker a small endorphin boost, like a stimulant. Ancient lulls carry a power that no one is quite sure how to measure. And our characters. Eve, our narrator, is a shape-shifting surveillance agent. She watches the hackers and reports on their movements to the audience and perhaps to a third party. Alice and Bob are generic hackers. They're in a sweet but tempestuous relationship. Charlie is the problem. He's a courier, which means that his type enables him to mediate between two generics like Alice and Bob, but his desire for Alice and Bob, both sexual and non-sexual, has sent him off the deep end. He wants to control them. Alice loves to look around the valley. She observes ancient lulls and collects their coordinates on her device, not to root them, but just to feel oriented. The plot centers around Charlie's theft of these coordinates from Alice's device and his attempt to mass root all of the ancient lulls. He thinks that if he completes the route, he will be able to use the lull's power to transcend his type, gain control of the environment, and of Alice and Bob. Grace is a government agent who enforces the ban on mining ancient lulls. Faith is a trusted advisor who helps Alice out. And Dave and Mal are two hackers who are pals with Charlie and Bob. And Sybil is a monster. The rumor is that she guards the ancient lulls. But Eve has never seen her, and Eve sees everything, just about. So does Sybil exist, or is she a myth invented to communicate what happens when one gets the lulls equivalent of gold fever? That is, overexposure to a certain kind of desire, a certain kind of device. Um, so finally, I'll read the like, kind of author notes that I've written for the play, and then we will start uh, the screening. So the entire play should be delivered in stage whispers, directed either at the audience or specific characters implying privileged communications. Throughout the script, the recipients of the whispers are always indicated along with the dialogue. Though gendered pronouns are used throughout the play, gender identification of characters should be unimportant and not factored into casting decisions. Some characters, such as Charlie the Courier, might not actually be people in the play's reality, representing rather the emergent dynamics between other characters, in Charlie's case, Alice and Bob. However, this latter fact should be left open for interpretation, and characters like Charlie, the shapeshifter Eve, and the monster Sybil in her brief appearances must be played as people. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for your attention, and I will just switch some things over, and then we'll start the play.